Hey, welcome to my podcast. My name is Dr. Brendan McCarthy. I am the Chief Medical Officer of Protea Medical Center in Chandler, Arizona. Uh, thank you for tuning in and welcome to my library. This is where I film. So today we're going to get into something that's important is uh, uh, understanding lab values and, and specific to thyroid. Why is this important? The symptoms I'm about to list for you are so common that oftentimes you present to your doctor and say, this is what I'm going through. And they're going to say, yeah, and who isn't experiencing that? And that can be so invalidating and it can be so off-putting. And it really does miss you as a person. So symptoms, common symptoms. Go to the doctor, you'll be like, I'm tired all the time. Uh, my hair's coming out. You know, it feels like I'm shedding. Uh, you're gaining weight. Your memory doesn't work as well as it used to. Nails are weak or they're breaking easily. You feel cold all the time. Your hands and your feet are cold easily. Um, there's depression, anxiety. You'll have insomnia, um, muscle aches, headaches, joint aches. You'll see uh, dry and rice skin. Maybe some horses when you speak. You know, those are some pretty common symptoms. Patients experience that a lot. You know, they're like, well, that's just part of, you know, life. You know, they'll, they'll tell you things like, you know, um, you're tired, you have insomnia, and you have, uh, you have uh, maybe some depression. Well, this, they, they'll give you an SSRI. That's their first step. Let's, let me give you an antidepressant. They won't even run a lab on that one. It's frustrating. It says, where's the lab work? Where's the, where's the quantification and understanding of the person ruling out anything else it could be? You know, when they say your hair is coming out, you go to your doctor saying your hair is coming out. Let me tell you, when you go to your physician and say your hair is coming out, that is a tough one to figure out for a physician. And it's so easy. I see so often they just pass the buck. And they just kind of blow it off a little bit because it's hard for them to diagnose. It is, alopecia or hair loss of any kind is not easy to diagnose. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. We're here for the hard work. That's our job. So if you're having hair loss, it's very subtle and very slow, but it's you're seeing it shedding in your shower, in the drain. You see where you brush your hair, it's on your clothes. A lot of times they'll say, yeah, it's nothing. And I've seen women come to my clinic with a bag, like a Ziploc bag full of hair that has fallen out of their head because they didn't want me. They were preloaded to be invalidated. How is that? That's cr it's crazy. I mean, it's helpful for me because I can look at the bulb. I can kind of examine the hair a little bit that way too. It's just not, not awful that she brought it in. But the reason why she brought it in is she was preloaded to be dismissed. The, 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 telling your doctor you're gaining weight, what's the first thing they tell you? <laughs> you know, what are they going to tell you? What do they, te what do they tell you? Stop eating so much. Did they even try and figure out why you're gaining weight? No. It's kind of the point where we're afraid to even talk about it with them because we're just going to be shamed with our lifestyle when it isn't always lifestyle. Um, constipation, they'll tell you to eat a laxative, take a laxative, you know, or eat more fruit. They don't really deal with that very much. Um, your memory's weak. When you go to your doctor and say you're, you're a woman in your 30s and maybe 40s and you have these symptoms, you say, you know, and I can't really remember things clearly. A lot of times they say, well, you're just harried because you're a mom and you have all these things going on or, you know, it's just whatever. Or they'll give you a simple memory test that's appropriate to screen you for dementia. And the type of memory, memory loss specific to thyroid isn't dementia. And uh, 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 one of those tests, the mini mental status exams is, that they're going to give you, that's not specific to thyroid. It's more specific to dementia. And you don't have dementia, you know? Nails are weak and break. They'll tell you to stop. I'm, and by the way, these are reported responses that patients get. I didn't make up these responses. This is what people have. Spoke, uh, this is what doctors tell them in the clinic. So when your nails are breaking, falling off, they tell you stop using so much nail polish. Stop going to the manicure place because you, you know that's you're reacting to it. That's what they'll tell you instead of really figuring you out. That's um, if you're feeling cold all the time, they'll just say this normal to being a woman. You know, what if you're lucky? <laughs> what if you're lucky your doctor says all right I'll, I'll run a thyroid panel on you you know what if they run labs on you what ends up happening is they run a basic panel for you and 
often, more often than not, when the results come in, they're just going to tell you you're normal. You're fine. The thing is, though, are you? When you go to the clinic and you present with symptoms like that and your doctor runs labs and tells you you're fine, the next step the doctor does is cast a wider net. That's what we're supposed to do. Our job is to help figure out why you're experiencing what you're experiencing. That is our job. And when we don't do that, we're not really doing our job. I want you to know that. What I want to circle back to here, which is important in the sum of this podcast, is this episode rather, is, is what is fine with labs? So then you go home defeated. You feel let down and then you do what all modern people do. You go to the internet. <laughs> you try to find out what on earth is going on with you. And you go down that rabbit hole. And some information is going to be good. Some is going to be bad. And the thing about it is, is, is that when you go down that road and try and figure yourself out, you know, what, happens when, what, do you, what happens when you go to your doctor and you bring them that research you got on the internet? What do they do? They mock you. You know? They dismiss you. I remember seeing that in medical school, like patients who go on the internet, they think they know everything. I remember hearing other physicians say that when I was a student. I remember that being something where they get condemned for researching what's going on with them. You, what, how, what else are you going to do when you get dismissed and validated? What, what other avenues do you have? And then they mock it because you're trying to figure out what's wrong and trying to figure this out and help yourself? That's not good medicine. When your doctor tells you your labs are fine, first of all, I don't do that. I don't just say they're just fine. I sit down with them and I go over the labs line by line, step by step, and I say, this is what this means. This is what that means. This is what this is at every step. Your doctor should explain to you the thyroid panel with you. They should explain, this is what I tested. This is what it means. Often they don't. Or often they do the most superficial test possible for the thyroid. When your doctor screens for thyroid, the lab they're going to run often is going to be thyroid stimulating hormone. And they'll do that as a standalone test. That is the lab that they do. They say, this is the way I'm going to figure out what's going on with your thyroid. The problem with it is that it's not a sensitive test, nor is it accurate. I want you to know that. Thyroid stimulating hormone is just us looking at your pituitary's opinion of how much thyroid is in there. The actual test that helps you understand what's happening with the thyroid is something called your free T3. That's called, tri the technical term is triiodothyronine. You just say free T3, that's good. That's the real test. Why is it that we're not running those labs? Why is it that we're not running a more detailed panel? Why is it that they're only relying on TSH? Well, it saves money. Up until the past maybe five years, 10 years, free T3 testing and, and free T4, which I'll get into in a minute, was pretty expensive. But those prices have gone down. And even so, they're not that expensive back then. It was more because if I ran a TSH in people, I would get a lot of false negatives, which means that I run the lab and your TSH looks fine. There's a lot of people who have a normal TSH that have low thyroid function and are actually hypothyroid even though the test looked good. And if I just rely on just this test and I miss these people, that's a great disservice to these people. But it's a great way to save money for insurance. I hate to say that. I know I'm sounding like I'm, I'm one of those um, alarmists or, or you know controversial. I'm not. I'm just being business right now. This is business. That's all this is. And so if I screen people and I get a TSH that looks good and I miss a segment of the population with subclinical hypothyroidism, well, they were not going to die when it's over there. And I don't have to treat them and we're good and it's cost effective. It's not human care effective. So what's the best way of approaching thyroid when you go to your doctor? What is it you should advocate for for yourself? Well, you got to get a TSH done. That's a thyroid stimulating hormone. Yes. And that's associated with something called the metabolic set point. And then you want to get with that a T4, the free T4, or th something also called thyroxine. Now, thyroxine is the precursor. Quick little human physiology thing. 
The pituitary has a thermostat for how high your thyroid should be. That's your TSH. It sends a signal down to your thyroid gland right here in your throat, right here, the little, the little butterfly-shaped little gland right there, and that releases T4. T4 is the precursor to T3, okay? T4, it comes out, it goes into circulation. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't bind to cells. It has zero biological activity. It only works when it gets bioconverted into T3. T3 is what does the work. So we test the pituitary, how much output of what the pituitary thinks is you should be. That's your TSH. Then we test T4, what's coming out of the gland. And then we test T3, which is in the circulation. When T4 turns to T3, that's the real job. That's the real working part of your thyroid, the T3. Those are the three tests we need to run with our patients. What are the reference ranges and what are we looking for? With TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone, again, coming from the pituitary, the reference range is 0.45 to 4.5 micro units per milliliter. Optimal, 0.1 to 1.0. That's considered to be optimal. Um, average in America we see right now is about 1.5. That's healthy right in there. If the TSH is too high, if it's above 4.5, or in my opinion, anything above 2.5 a lot of times, that's implying that there's not enough thyroid hormone. So the higher the TSH goes, the lower your actual active hormone really is. So again, here we go. TSH, anything above 2.5 or the higher it moves, the lower the active hormone is. Now, after we have that, the second two tests we're gonna run is the free T3 and free T4. Now, why am I saying free before those the, as a preface? Why am I saying that? Well, free implies that the hormone is biologically available to be used. Why I'm saying that is because thyroid hormone tends to get bound to protein and rendered inert this is important you don't want your doctor running a total t3 you want them running a free t3 total t3 most of it is bound to protein and doesn't do anything the free part like i said that touches cells that does the actual work you only want free t3 and free t4 one funny thing especially for women is, is that that bound part of thyroid the the, the bound to protein T3 and T4 that's bound, the binding agent is increased with estrogen. The more estrogen you have, the more your thyroid gets bound up. That's why women with estrogen dominance have slow metabolism because all their thyroid is being bound to protein. You want to know how much is free that's touching cells. That's the most important thing. For the free, the two free hormones we want to test in there, free T4, thyroxine, the reference range is 0.82 to 1.77. Now, optimal 1.25 to 1.77, in my opinion, in my experience, that's a good range to be at, okay? That's important. Thyroxine, free T4, is the precursor to free T3, the one that does the work. If there's low levels of thyroxine, that implies that either TSH is low, right? Your brain is not sending enough signal to the gland, so there's something wrong up here. Or if it's low, it means the gland itself is not making enough hormone. That could be due to an autoimmune condition. It could be due to a nutritional issue. Any one of those things, high stress could play a role in that as well. When it's too high, that usually also implies an autoimmune condition could be at play. Um, more often than not, it's, it's autoimmune. The other one would be just taking too much thyroid medication if T4 is too elevated in those cases. T4 is turned into T3 mostly in your liver and your muscle. This is important, especially the liver part. So T4 comes out of the gland, goes into your circulation, does nothing, okay? Thyroxine does nothing, free T4 does nothing until it gets converted in your liver and your muscle into free T3. Once it's free T3, biologically active, doing the business. Free T3 or triiodothyronine, mouthful, is the most important thing we will discuss because that's the one that does the work. That's important, okay? Um, free T3 normal range is 2.0 to 4.8. I know some lab companies will say 4.2, so only 4.4. They're doing that based upon the averages that they see. That's the averages in America right now. Anything above or below is considered to be the, the too high or too low, but it's really the averages right in the middle there. Um, optimal in the literature, not my opinion, the literature and research. 
to 4.8. That's the that's legitimately the optimal range for a host of reasons. I will do numerous podcasts moving forward why that's important because it's a good thing to talk about. So what what would cause low levels of T3? You know, again, back to T4. You don't have enough T4. T4 turns into T3. Remember, it gets converted. So you don't have enough T4. That's a problem. Or TSH, your brain is not sending the signal anymore. That could be a cause of it as well. Um, one thing could be that the T4, you have plenty of T4, but in the liver and the, the muscle, it's not getting turned into T3 very well at all. That happens. That's called poor conversion. Okay. Um, sometimes you'll have too much estrogen. Too much estrogen affects this pathway and lowers your free T3. Poor liver health. Because if you're not converting T4 into T3, remember it happens in the liver is one of the big places. If your liver is compromised, if someone has liver pathology due to alcohol consumption or due to NSAID, like um, um, uh, taking Tylenol or a leave or any one of those other medications at too high of a level, they're not going to be converting it very well. People who eat a really high fast food diet or very processed diet and their liver is under under strain from that and you'll see in their labs their liver enzymes will be a little bit elevated you'll see that conversion to t4 and t3 is sluggish so the t3 gets lowered because of their diet because they're not eating very healthy and their liver is very very liver's having pathology because it's dealing with this junk and the liver can't convert t4 into t3 very well stress zinc or selenium deficiency these things all play a role with the conversion to t4 and t3 and that will slow down the generation of T3. When you're under a lot of stress, it totally does that. If you have a deficiency of zinc and selenium, zinc and selenium is the, en is the enzyme that converts T4 into T3, needs zinc and selenium to do its job. So, okay, so let's, let's bring this into real life right now. You're like, I have a thyroid problem. I went to my doctor. My doctor blew me off. He said everything was good, but man, it looks like I need this. I go online, I go down the rabbit hole, and it looks like thyroid, and this person who's trying to push me now on a thyroid supplement, I'm going to buy this thyroid supplement because no one understands me. I got to take this thyroid supplement. And in the thyroid supplement has zinc and selenium. <laughs> That's not a bad thing. Okay, hold on here just for a minute. The zinc and selenium is appropriate if you don't have enough T3 and you have plenty of T4. Those cases, I give my patients plenty of zinc and selenium and rerun the lab and verify it did its work. When your doctor just blows you off and you have to figure this out on your own, you're experimenting with these things that we don't know if they'll help or not. There are other reasons why your thyroid would be off that have nothing to do with zinc and selenium. But because you were left alone to try and figure this out on your own, what else are you going to do? You're not know, anyone working with you. We're supposed to work with you. That's who we are. So, so the zinc and the selenium, that's appropriate in certain circumstances, but you have to do it in the right time, otherwise it won't work, and then you'd be frustrated, still in the same place, but now you're spending all this money on supplements that aren't doing anything because that's not indicated for what's going on with you. And, and if they are indicated, you gotta have your doctor side by side with you verifying that it worked, you know? You really need that. You deserve, not that you need, you need it too. You need it, but more than that, you deserve it. You deserve it. This is what we're supposed to do. The important thing that I want to sum up with is, is that you deserve a relationship with your doctor that is collaborative and not confrontational, not adversarial. And too often it becomes that. And I want to say, Trust is everything in medicine and we have to earn that with you. And how we do that is being present, listening to you, explaining to you what we think, why we think the way we think, being accountable to you, caring about what you think. <laughs> How's that one? I care about what you think. What do you think? How do you feel about this? What's your experience? I know what I'm saying sounds super heretical. Heret, heret, heretic? Heret, heretical? <laughs> this sounds, sounds like I'm, you know, like I'm crazy. But is it? You know, it isn't. Our trust, your, your trust means everything to me. Because that's our relationship is built on that. And you trust me to do my job. And I earn your trust by communicating clearly with you 
and then you'd rely on me. I want you to know your doctor should be earning your trust. We shouldn't walk into a room and demand it. We shouldn't walk in the room and demand it and say, we're doing this, you have that, that's it, and walk out the door. It's about that relationship and that trust. And I want you to know how valuable your trust is in those relationships. And I want you to keep valuing it and, and not to give it lightly. And that you're, you, you have every right to demand your physician earn your trust. I hope this helps. Your comments are important to me. Justin and I, we look for the comments. We read your comments. We go through them. And it gives us ideas on how to be better at this. I love doing this. I do. Your comments mean a lot. I also love when you guys help each other in the comment section. I know I say it almost every episode now, but I mean it. I really do. I love this community that's being built around here. There will be relevant links in the description for the research that I used for this podcast because, as always, I research this. I prepare for it. You deserve that. That's how I earn your trust. That's how I earn your trust. I show you why I got to this point of thought, why I think the way I think. Okay? You deserve that. So please share, like, subscribe, and uh, I will see you next time. Thank you.